Good morning. Man, I'm excited to be here with you this morning. I'm so excited. I forgot there was a video going. I almost came right up and ruined the whole thing. But I thank you for being here this morning. I am so blessed and excited to share the word with you. I'm so thrilled because the Easter bunny came last night. He left his colorful little droppings all over the backyard, and and I heard there's money in some of those and candy. That's something to be excited about, but I'm even more excited that he is risen. I'm even more excited for the real reason that we're here today, because the, the resurrection of Jesus has changed me. It has changed you and it can change the rest of your lives if you simply believe. I want to thank you for being here. I know there's a, a lot of folks here today uh, who have not been to church in a while. May, maybe you don't go to church at all. Maybe you don't even believe in this stuff. But you're here because mama asked you to come to church. And it's Easter and you respect your mama. I respect that. Thank you for being here. There might be some people here who have gone to church their whole life on Christmas and Easter, and you respect the word, you respect religion, but it's really not your thing. I appreciate you being here, and I, I respect you. I, I thank you. You know, churches really try to put out, pull out all the stops for Easter. They try to do a whole lot of things to, to make it relevant for you. You know, a lot of churches, they try to put their most handsome pastor out front, right? <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> I was going to make the joke, yes, but... Uh, Uh, Unfortunately, our handsome pastor preached on Good Friday, so I'm left over. This is what you get. But here's what I promise. (laughs) He's a seven. Yeah. Here's what, here's what I, my promise is to you. Uh, I will be quick and I will be direct because I respect your time and I'm grateful that you're here and that you're giving me a listen. Easter is the day when we remember that all the promises of God came true. They may not have happened yet in this reality, but there is no stopping them now because Jesus has overcome the grave. He has overcome the dead. So I just want to share with you, if you're visiting with us today or if you're a long-term member, I just have three things that I want to share with you today, three things that I want you to know about the resurrection of Jesus. The first thing is that the resurrection of Jesus was real. The resurrection of Jesus was real. This is kind of important, okay? And, and I... I I'm not being totally silly when I say that because there's a lot of folks out there throughout history who have had a real struggle with uh, God doing some sort of miracle and raising somebody from the dead. And so they, they said maybe Jesus rose in spirit or, or, or maybe Jesus rose in our hearts and he's alive in here, you know, just like my dog from when I was in first grade and died. He's alive in my heart. But that's not what the Bible says. The resurrection of Jesus is real. In fact, what the Bible says is if the resurrection of Jesus wasn't real, we are wasting our time being here. Our faith is useless. So Jesus rose from the dead. It was a real resurrection, which meant his real body stopped being dead. He started breathing again. Blood pumped through his veins again. His, his eyes and his mind and his muscles started working. And as, as real as I am here in front of you, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, rose up and walked out of that grave. And he's still alive today in that form. John, verse, uh, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 27. They, they really bring this home. So Jesus had risen from the dead, and it talks about his disciples. It talks about Thomas, also known as Didymus. He was one of the 12. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, if I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. Unless that happens, I will not believe. Thomas was a skeptic. Thomas doubted. I don't blame him. I have that same kind of mindset. I like to feel and touch. I like to know that the things that I believe in are certain because I'm basing the whole rest of my life and possibly my eternity on them. So this is what Jesus did. It says, going on, it says, a week later, 
His disciples were in that house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting. Believe. The resurrection of Jesus was a physical resurrection. You can touch him. You could touch those scars, which are no longer scars. They're badges of honor for what he accomplished on the cross. And when we get to heaven, we'll be able to shake Jesus' hand, give Jesus a big hug. He's going to be able to interact with us because that's how real it is. Now, if you're visiting with us or you're a little skeptical yourself, you don't believe in this thing, you might be thinking right now, What kind of toothless hillbillies believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead? Look around. I think we clean up nice, right? Okay. Yeah, we we really, really believe that, but we don't believe it for no reason. In fact, I think we have better reasons to believe that than maybe you have to believe what you believe. See, Jesus didn't just raise from the dead, get seen by a couple people, and then disappear in a vanishing act, and so it was a big controversy. He actually stuck around for about a month, right? And he appeared to individuals, but he also appeared to entire groups of people, large groups of people. And so there would, be, there would have been plenty of time for anybody who was skeptical about the resurrection of Jesus, like Thomas, one of his own disciples, there would have been plenty of time for them to verify that story and prove that it's false. You know, if Jesus wasn't around, they could keep going to the disciples. Where is he now? Where is he now? Where is he? Jesus has been in the bathroom for 40 days, guys. You got to show him at some point, right? No, he, he actually appeared to people. There were eyewitnesses, and there were so many people that knew what had happened that the Bible says the first day that, pre- that Peter preached the message for people to become Christian, thousands of people believed. Thousands of people at that point. They had already heard the rumors. Many of them had probably seen Jesus. They were able to verify it with their own eyes. And so the church started, not with just a couple people, not with just 12 people. The first day the church kicked off, man, there were 3,000 people worshiping. And it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing, all on this one message that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay? And then his followers, those disciples that once maybe doubted, a lot of those disciples questioned him during his life and his ministry, the records that we have of their death are gruesome. I won't share them with you here because we're all going to go to lunch in a little bit. I don't want to spoil your appetite. But they died horrible, torturous deaths. And it wasn't because They thought Jesus was a real person. It wasn't because they thought Jesus was a real teacher or a good teacher. It wasn't any of that. The one claim that forced them to go through the painful deaths that they died was that Jesus walked out of death. He is alive today. Okay, They endured all sorts of things for that. I don't know about you. I, I've told some lies in my day. I've told some, some whoppers. But if I, were, uh, if I had my, uh, those thumb screws put on me, if I had some discomfort applied, I'll abandon a lie like that. I will say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'll do anything to make it up. You know, let me just go and live my life in peace. But they went through horrible deaths because they believed that the resurrection was true because they had seen it with their eyes. This is recorded in all sorts of historical documents. We have a a lot of different documents which show that, but of course the Bible, this book here, is our primary source. It's our primary document for what happened. Now you might be thinking, if you're visiting here, you're skeptical, you're not really sure about all this, what kind of uh, farmer's tan wearing, trucker hat back, NASCAR watching hillbillies would believe in the Bible? Okay, and I I respect that question, but let me just challenge you on that. I I actually would like to say that the Bible is the most well-attested and trustworthy historical document that we have in existence today. The Bible is not a a bunch of stories that were dreamed up and and, and thought of and, and, and like, you know, a few hundred years ago or something. The Bible was written just years, its first writings were just years after Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, okay? It was written by eyewitness accounts. In fact, some books of the Bible say, I went all over and I searched for eyewitnesses so I could tell you this story. 
Beyond that, we have so many copies of this original text that we can be sure that what we're reading is that first eyewitness history. And I don't want to bore you a whole lot, but you may have heard of a guy named Caesar, Julius Caesar. He, he wrote a book uh, called uh, Gallic Wars, and it recorded a lot of his conquest. Nobody doubts Caesar. Nobody wonders if he really existed or did the things that he did. You know, we have uh, all of our knowledge from Caesar about uh, his conquest. It comes from about 10 copies of manuscripts that we have from him. You may have heard of a guy named Plato. He was a great philosopher, uh, genius, probably lived at the same time as Jeremiah, the prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, If you like any of his philosophy, that all comes from about seven copies of manuscripts that we have from his work. The most famous historian that we have is named Tacitus. He, he 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 gives us a lot of our ancient history that we believe and that we use to understand what happened in the world. We have about 20 copies of what he wrote. Uh, The most well-attested document outside of the Bible is the Iliad. You probably read that in high school or tried to read it and then fell asleep and then looked up the cliff notes, right? Uh, Homer, right? We have 643 original copies of the Iliad that were ancient enough to say that um, they are close to the actual writing of Homer. We have over 5,000 copies of the New Testament. That's just in Greek. We have 10,000 in Latin. We have uh, another 15,000 in different languages. And if you count the pottery and all those different things, we have over 25,000 copies, ancient copies of the Bible. This is, by any historical academic standard, this is the best ancient source of any history that you can get. Okay? The Bible, we call it the Word of God, but at the very least, when you read this, you know that you're reading something that can be trusted. And that Bible, this word has changed the lives of literally billions of people throughout history. This book has been used as a spiritual guide. It has used to build the church, not this church, but the church worldwide. There are Christians right now in China, well, not right now, but whatever the time difference is, there are Christians in China who are getting up and worshiping at the, at the threat of being killed. There are Christians in, in Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and countries that you and I probably have never heard of who are sneaking around to church right now just so that they can uh, worship the risen Savior because this book and the power of God has changed their lives. And for 2,000 years, God's church has stood the test. God's church has been asked all the difficult questions. God's church has been challenged by, by all, of the, all of the criticisms that you, that you may uh, be able to drum up or think about or, or wonder why, uh, why people believe these things through grotesque persecutions, through times of, uh, of, uh, of terrible corruption within itself. God's church continued to grow and thrive, and today we are still here because we know that Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen from the dead. We have in our lineage some of the finest philosophers, some of the most brilliant scientists and mathematicians. You may have heard of Blaise Pascal. He was a great mathematician. He had a lot to do with probability theory and actually how we use money in banks today comes from him. He came up with this idea called Pascal's Wager. He said, uh, he said if, if you want to ask whether or not I should live my life following Jesus. Well, let's look at the odds, right? Or let's look at what we gain either way. If I live my life following Jesus and I'm wrong, I've lived a good life, I've loved good people, I've been with God's people, and I've been with the church, and I've done good things. If I live my life for God and I'm right, I have gained an eternity of glory and bliss and happiness. He said it just makes sense just makes sense. Isaac Newton, and I'm not talking about people who were uh, just nominally Christian. Uh, Isaac Newton was a passionate Protestant. He would write uh, deep and devoted prayers. He was actually, he studied the Bible more than he studied physics, but even more recently, you know, after the scientific revolutions and everything that we have and all the interesting research that's going on, the director of the National, what's it called? National um, Genomic Human Genome Research Institute, there you go, for 15 years. This guy named Francis Collins, he's still with us, if if I'm not mistaken. He was an atheist, but he looked into his field of science so deeply and got to a point where he said, 
time and chance are just not enough to explain the intricacies of who we are. He became a devoted follower of Jesus. So if you ever ask yourself, what kind of backwoods, white trash, Ohio State fan base people, (laughs) I will put my team up against your team any day of the week. I will put the lineage of Christianity up against the lineage of any other idea. Christian, if you're here today, I want you to know you can believe, you can trust the reasons you believe. I want you to know why you believe. I don't want anybody here to believe in Jesus because it just feels all warm and fuzzy inside. I want you to understand that we have rock-solid reasons to believe that the resurrection of Jesus was real. If you're here today and you're not a believer, maybe you're, you're not a committed Christian, or, or you're, not just, you're just not sure about all this religious stuff. You respect religion, and, and you come when you can, but you're just not you know, kind of on the fence. You're not really devoted. I want to ask you a question. Why? Why do you believe what you believe? I had a conversation just a couple months ago with a man here in Flushing. He came up to me at an event we were doing, and uh, he knew we were with the church and everything. And he started the conversation a little bit strangely. He said, "Uh, you're one of those Bible thumpers. (laughs) That's not wrong, I guess. Uh, And he asked me a whole bunch of questions, a lot of the questions that we get asked all the time, and there are those, you know, kind of softball questions, and we we deal with them, and that's that's fine. They weren't very challenging. But then I, I asked him, I said, how, you know, how old are you? And he, he was in his uh, late 60s. I said, why do you believe that Jesus is not real? Why do you believe that there is nothing spiritual about this world? Why do you believe that you, a human, are the source of all your meaning and purpose? And he said, well, I don't know, I just kind of think it. I thought, man, you must think you're pretty smart. I mean, if, if there is an eternity, but even if there's not, even if this, this life was all they had, wouldn't you want to base what you believe in and how you live your life and your philosophy on something more than just what you think? Just something more than what seems right to you? Well, I saw something on TV. Sounded right. I'm not trying to attack you, but I hope you feel challenged because I have a rock-solid case to base my life and my eternity on. I, I believe in Jesus for a whole lot of reasons that I haven't mentioned, but all the ones that I did, and I've seen him change my life, and I've seen him change dozens and dozens of other people's lives in ways that nothing else can. I've seen him work in this world. It's true, and it's real. And I don't want you to walk through this life just hoping that whatever default you're set on is the right one. There's a better way. And that brings me to my second point. First thing about the resurrection of Jesus is that the resurrection of Jesus is real. The second thing I want you to know about the resurrection of Jesus is that the resurrection of Jesus is your road. It is your road. See, we think of it as just an historical event, but it's so much more than that. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 3 is one of my favorite passages that I'll have up here on the slides for you. It says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He calls Jesus here something that's very, uh, very important. He calls him the pioneer of our faith. I think we live in exciting times. I I love watching all these rockets launch from Texas and Florida, and they're going up and putting satellites, and they're talking about putting a man on Mars. You know, sometimes when we drive through the country on vacation or whatnot, I'll just look around in the fields and everything and just wonder what it must have been like for those first people to come and inhabit this area. You know, we have people coming across that Siberian land bridge 
right, coming across through California and coming across all the way to the East Coast. And then we have the European explorers coming across and, and settling this new land that they never imagined even existed. A whole new world to explore. Now we're talking about putting people on Mars and somebody's going to go up there and, and walk around a little bit. And if he doesn't die, then we're going to send another one, right? And we're talking about a moon base and Mars base and exploring space. I mean, this is kind of a cool time to be alive. Jesus was a pioneer like we can't be. He was the one who went before us. See, the, the whole point of being a pioneer is that people are supposed to follow you. You're, you're blazing that trail. You're, you're showing people that there is a way. And so when it calls Jesus the, the pioneer of our faith, he went through everything that we're supposed to go through, which means we're supposed to follow. He said it was for the joy that was set before him. See, Jesus knew the resurrection was coming. The only one who did know the resurrection was coming, but the cross was first. So he endured the cross, despising its shame. The joy was the glory of the resurrection. It was the sins of the world paid for. It was the birth of this thing called the church. It was Satan having his power taken away. Taken away. The Bible says that Jesus now holds the keys to death and Hades, and Satan is powerless. He only has his schemes in his wiles. But he knew that there would be a wave of people that would begin to understand that there is new life and hope in their lives and eternal life that is available to them. The joy of the resurrection was there, but he had to go through the cross. And if he's our pioneer, then we have to follow him. Romans 6, verses 5 to 7 says this, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. I don't know if you know this, but your eternal destiny is not to be a, a cartoon angel floating on a cloud playing a harp. Your eternal destiny is to rise up from the grave just like Jesus did. Your eternal destiny, if you believe in Jesus, you trust in him, is to live in a new heaven, uh, on, a, on a new earth, under a new heaven that was created without any chance of sin or evil entering this world, to have joy and fellowship and light eternal, to know God, to actually be able to walk up to him and talk with him, just like, just like in the garden when he created all things. You're not going to some sort of spiritual uh, life in the clouds. Your destination is to follow Jesus to the resurrection. But that does mean that you have to go through the cross. See, to follow Jesus to the resurrection means that your sins will be washed away, that your path, your past, excuse me, will be nullified. That your life will be completely new and, and the shame and the guilt that you bear for the things that you've done and are doing right now is no longer with you. You have nothing but future ahead of you. But you have to go through the cross. The road to life includes death. One of my pet peeves is when preachers uh, try to sound like salespeople, you know, uh, uh, Trust today and you can have eternal life and happiness and bliss. And if you act now, we have a mansion in heaven for you. And, and they try to just make it sound wonderful, like it's a great deal, you know, and, and it's, it's a great deal. But it's a hard road, too. I think the offer that Jesus makes to us is more real than that. I think the offer that Jesus makes to us meets us where we are and meets us in our human condition. The offer that Jesus makes to us, is, it says, let me get that passage, that Romans 6 passage back up there, that you were enslaved to sin. Now, you may not call it that, but you know what he's talking about. If you've ever said to yourself, why, why do I keep doing these things that make my life miserable? 
Why do I keep going back to that drink, to that girl, to that guy? Why do I keep wasting my time, my money, my love, my passion, my emotion, when nothing but misery seems to follow, but I can't stop? The Bible calls that slavery to sin. Some of you today know exactly what I'm talking about. You're alive, but you feel like the walking dead. You're alive, but your life is just wrapped in misery and sorrow and depression. You wish for anything that would change your life, but at the end of the day, you just can't stop going back to those things that hurt you. Some of you feel this, but you're not ready to admit that you're you're part of the problem. Uh, You might have a a broken family, broken relationships, hurt marriage, not talking to your, your spouse, your kids. You might have anger and hatred filling your heart. You might dehumanize and and think of everybody who disagrees with you on maybe one side of the aisle or a certain type of person is less than important, less than human. And you still feel that brokenness and that loneliness and that hurt. God didn't create you to live your life like this. God didn't create you to stay stuck in your sin. The resurrection of Jesus is your road. But he does ask you to do something very, very hard. Something very difficult to get there. There is hope for you if you're willing to go through that. I heard a quote the other day. It's one of those quotes that uh, changed my thinking, changed my life, and I'll be saying it forever. All right, I don't know who originally said it. I, I probably won't say it exactly the way it's said, but I want you to think about this. He said, uh, sometimes things in our lives are so dark. All right, everything's pressed in around us. Things are going so bad. Thing, everything just feels like darkness and misery, and it feels like we have been buried when actually we have been planted. I want you to think through that. That in your darkest moments, in the place where you feel like you have been left for dead, if there is a God who loves you, if there is purpose for you being there, then there's hope for life. You're not buried, you're planted. You're in a hopeless place, but there is a reason that you're there. It's really hard. In fact, the Bible likens it to the death of Jesus, crucifixion. Mark chapter 8 says this. It says uh, in verse 34, this is Jesus talking. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? My third thing about the resurrection of Jesus that I want you to know is that the resurrection of Jesus is here today. It's here in your life today. It's not something that you have to wait for. Jesus says in this verse, deny yourself. See, our main problem, what the Bible calls sin, is that we are living Not for others, not for some better cause, but for ourselves. We keep going to the things that we want. We keep going back to our pleasures, those things that give us a a little hit, a little little bit of a high, a little bit of joy, even if we know they're going to cause misery later. See, the the Bible says that we are living for ourselves because we are our God. We choose our wants over what God wants for us. So Jesus said, let's play this out. It, let, let's say you get the pleasure you want. Let's say you, you get wealth and you get uh, power and you get uh, intimate relationships and, and you get everything that you want. You gain the entire world. It must feel good to, gain, to have the entire world. What have you really gained if you have gained the entire world but you have lost your soul? If this resurrection is true and there's an eternity waiting for you, the Bible says, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. You've gained the entire world, but you have nothing. When you enter eternity, 
without Jesus. So he says, take up your cross. And that, that means one thing. I want to be very clear on this. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you know, different things that might inconvenience you or, or be plaguing you or hurting you. The cross was the number one method of execution in Jesus' day. Okay, So when Jesus said, take up your cross, everybody understood what he was saying is die. Be prepared to die. Now, he doesn't want you to die physically. This isn't some self-harm or anything like that. He says, die, but die to yourself, okay? Follow me by dying to yourself, dying to your sin. What does it mean to die to your sin? Well, when somebody is dead, the, the classic way to know that they're dead is that they are completely unresponsive, right? You, you can poke them, you can prod them, nothing is going to move, nothing's going to happen. That's what it means to die to your sin, to your old way of life, whatever those things are, and I don't know what they are, but you know exactly what they are, because God is working in your heart right now and bringing those to your mind. Whatever those sins are in your life, all right, God would have you to leave those, to be unresponsive to those, to, 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 uh, to agree with God, to take responsibility for your sins, to agree with God that those are not what he would want for you, that those were wrong, and to walk away. Now, why don't we do that? Why is it so hard? Why, does, why is it akin to dying in Jesus' language? Well, for one, I, I don't think any of us know how to carry that load. So if you're like, if you're like me, You've got things that you wish you never did in your life. You've got things that in your past that, that you wish that you had never done. You could go back and you'd smack yourself silly and say, don't do that. That's silly, right? You've got, you've got sin that you're ashamed of. You might be here today with a heavy load of guilt, and you know that if you were to say what God says about your sin, if you were to agree with God about this, that it would just be too much, that you couldn't bear the weight of all of that. That's exactly what Jesus did on the cross for you. See, Jesus doesn't want you to bear the weight of your sin. He doesn't want you to try to make up for the bad things that you've done. In fact, he says, you can't do that. There's no way you can undo the bad that you've done. I can't unhurt the people that I've hurt, right? I, I, I can't unsay the things that I've said. But Jesus said, I carried that load for you on the cross. When I died that death, that was me taking your sin. And all I want you to do is acknowledge it. All I want you to do is take that responsibility and give it to me and know that I have paid your debt. And now my blood, my life will wash you clean and give you hope for a new life. Jesus carried that load on the cross. Give him your sin. Give him your past. Give him your present. Give him your future. That's the hard thing that he asks you to do. That's the, the death that he asks you to go through, to walk through the cross so that you can experience the resurrection. And when you do that, when you follow that road that Jesus made for us, when you step down that trail that he blazed, when you follow our pioneer, that moment when you die to yourself and reach up to heaven and you break through the ground and you realize that there is light and there is life and there is hope for you, the Bible says you will be a new person. You will be nothing but future, okay? That you will have a new life. You will be God's son or daughter. You will be made holy for his purpose and he is going to work through you and you have been forgiven. There's growth, there's light, there's life. No matter where you are or what you come here today with, there's hope. Will you cast your sin on Jesus? Let him carry that load and trust him. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads for a moment. We're just going to be here for another couple minutes, but I want to take this moment to challenge you again. Because I, I think a lot of people out there have never been challenged. They've never allowed themselves to really think through this. And, and so this is the time. Why do you believe what you believe? Are you buried? Do you feel hopeless? Do you feel stuck in life? Do you have anything to base your hope for tomorrow on?
Are you just trying to avoid thinking through the pain and the guilt that your actions, that your sin has brought on you? Every person in this room who was worshiping this morning has been where you are. Let me tell you, it's a a scary thing. It's a difficult thing for some people to do. But God is here for you today, right now, saying, just just let me carry that. That load is too heavy for you. The death of Jesus on the cross was sufficient to pay for your sins. You can give that weight to him now. I'm going to pray. You can pray your own prayer. You can pray with me. You can pray something close to what I'm praying. But if you're here today and you just need to know how to do that, I want to just try to walk with you through that. And Father, I come to you with my own sin. I know the actions that I've taken, the things that I've done, are not pleasing to you. They're against what you have for me and they've caused so much grief and pain to me and others. There's nothing I can do to make those things right again. I simply need you to take my sin, to forgive me, to take that sin away. Believe that the death of Jesus on the cross was for me, that it paid for my sin. I believe that the resurrection of Jesus was real and I want to follow him down that road. I trust you. I want you to know Pastor Angel, myself, we have elders who are here. We're going to sing this last song, but we'll, we're going to be up here. And if you've prayed that prayer or you prayed something like it, or if you just need to pray, if you need someone to talk to, someone to walk with you through those steps, our whole life is about this. We want to help you and guide you and take you. We can even find a, a place out of the way where, where no one will hear or see. We want to walk with you through this. As we turn it over to our music team, we're going to worship, but I'd invite you down. If you, if you need prayer, if you have questions, this is your time.